Good morning and a very warm welcome to you as we gather together for worship and from our home to yours, a very, very warm greeting. Today, as we get to the, the next section in our Apostles' Creed, we're looking at, I believe, in the resurrection of the body. And one of the things that struck me is that the early church moved its day of worship from the Jewish Sabbath to the first day of the week, Sunday, because this is the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And this was so significant for them that they moved their day of worship to this day of resurrection. And it speaks to us of how important the resurrection is. Now on Easter Sunday, we often start the Sunday morning service with me shouting to the congregation, the Lord is risen, and the congregation enthusiastically responds, He is risen indeed. Now, the early church would say to us, don't just do that on Easter Sunday, but on every Sunday. Because every Sunday is a, a celebration of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And so, the Lord is risen. Amen. He is risen indeed. And hallelujah. As we worship God together this morning, I do want to welcome you to the service, praying that you'll experience God's presence in every aspect of our service, in the hymns, in the prayers, in the readings, in the message, and that you may know God's peace. Our call to worship comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, where Paul writes to the Corinthians about the doubts that they were experiencing about the resurrection. And here are just a few verses from that beautiful chapter that speak to us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12 But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And then the chapter ends on this triumphant note. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? We worship God as we sing, Thine be the glory. Risen, conquering Son.
Dear Father, we can't begin to grasp your holiness and goodness. We are recipients of your amazing love and grace, even when we don't deserve it. You guide us and help us. You comfort and heal us. You redeem and restore us. You prompt us and show us where we can improve and make a difference. Thank you for always being present, even when we are far from you, Lord. Your church is a safe haven, an environment to grow in, and a representation of our belonging to you. Help us to be part of the growth and life of your bride, your church. You want every single person to enter your kingdom, and we should be the hands and the feet of Jesus to help accomplish that. We can only do this with your spirit and strength in us. Lord, your mercies cover all our sin. We confess we have sinned and need your forgiveness. We have not listened to your promptings and have tried to do things in our own strength. Please forgive us for not always trusting you enough and putting all our faith in in you. We often think of ourselves first, before others. We don't have empathy or sympathy, especially because we don't know the full story. But you do, Lord, and they are your children. Forgive us for not always consulting your word, as it is a guide to all relationships and situations in our lives. Help us to not be self-centered and concerned only about our comfort. We know that being a Christian is about growth and especially growing closer to you. Help us to not put our worth and success in our work and worldly things, but in knowing you. You created us and love us for who we are. Thank you for being our light and guide in the world. Amen.
Good morning, boys and girls. It's lovely to be with you on this Resurrection Sunday morning. And I think you'll remember this picture that I showed last week at our Palm Sunday service. Do you remember it? Where Jesus says to the Pharisees when they ask him to get the disciples to keep quiet, he says, if the disciples keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now there's a lady by the name of Patty Rokas, or maybe Rokas, who thought about that verse for a little while and she was walking on a hiking trail when she came across a heart-shaped stone and that heart-shaped stone got her thinking and she picked up a whole bunch of stones and when she came home she packed the stones into an arrangement and a beautiful picture emerged and so have a look at this video here Isn't that just beautiful? That the rocks would cry out, that the stones would cry out, that, that we would see in, in the beauty of creation and in the beauty of human imagination, the ability to worship God through pictures and, and to tell the story through pictures. And what a wonderful thing Patty has done to, to tell the story of Jesus with pictures. But you and I can also tell the story. We can tell the story of God's love. We can tell the story of how Jesus died on the cross but rose from the dead. And we can tell it through our smiles, through our kind words, through our actions, through the example that we set, through the way that we are good friends to people around us, faithful friends, friends who don't say ugly things and do ugly things. When we do all of these things, we can be messengers for Jesus. And on this Resurrection Sunday, when we think about how Jesus defeated death, let's tell his story. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that there are so many ways that we can tell others about you. Help us to do that, Lord, and to bring glory to your name. Thank you that you are alive forevermore. We praise you and worship you. In Jesus' name, Amen.
As we come to our scripture reading this morning, I'd like you to imagine the scene with me. Christ has been crucified, and the crucifixion was tough. The disciples imploded. They ran away. John was the only one of the male disciples actually at the cross. The women were there, but the rest of the men were gone. And then Jesus is buried, hurriedly, in a borrowed tomb, and without all the preparations completed because the Sabbath was upon them and they had to get home. The disciples are mourning, they're broken, they're shattered by the heartache and the sense of loss that they've been through. And then on Sunday morning the rumours come. Rumours that the stone has been rolled away, that the tomb is empty. And then Mary comes back and says that she'd seen him. And then Peter has some kind of encounter with the risen Christ all by himself. And two disciples come in from Emmaus, having rushed back at, at, in, at the end of the day, barely getting to Jerusalem in time, saying that Jesus had walked with them all day. And it's confusion and uncertainty. And, and everybody is not quite sure. Is this real? Is it, is it wishful thinking? Could they trust it? And then in the next moment, Jesus is present. Incredible and amazing. And the room is filled with joy and excitement, peace and hope. The disciples are transformed and, and go to tell Thomas, who hadn't been there, what had happened. And Thomas, for reasons of his own, is, wasn't with the rest of the disciples, maybe so despondent at Jesus' death. Remember that although we portray Thomas as a petty skeptic and, and as someone who is faithless, he was willing to die with Jesus. Way back in John 11, when the disciples warned Jesus about going to see Lazarus, and they say, they try to kill you, and, and Jesus says, I'm going. And Thomas says, let's go with him, and we'll die with him. And yet somehow Thomas's promises didn't work out. Maybe he's disillusioned in himself. Maybe there's something deeper. But Thomas is skeptical. And so a week later, the disciples are gathered together again. And Jesus meets them there. And he meets Thomas in the midst of his pain. And he treats Thomas with such grace, with such kindness. It's hard to imagine Jesus seeing Thomas as a petty skeptic. Instead, it seems that Jesus takes Thomas incredibly seriously and meets him in the midst of his pain. And so let's listen to the beautiful encounter of Jesus' resurrection as he meets with his disciples, not just once, but twice. Let's listen to God's word. John 20, 19 to 33. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. 
Let's pray. Father, we've heard your word, and what a beautiful word it is. Now open our hearts as we reflect on your word and apply it to our lives. Be with the words that I speak. Be with the thoughts of our hearts. Fill us with hope and the sense of the triumph and the victory that your death and resurrection brings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Creed says, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And this belief is vitally important. It's vitally important in three significant ways. Firstly, the idea of the bodily resurrection is important because it speaks to the work and nature of Christ. You see, resurrection means that his work was complete, that all the prophecies that, that were made, that, um, and, and we remember how Peter quotes the psalmist when the psalmist says, my holy one will not see decay. Peter quotes that in his sermon on Pentecost, talking about how Christ raised, is raised from the dead. The prophecies are fulfilled. And it means that Christ had victory over death, and death was a consequence of sin. And, and if he wasn't raised from the dead, physically raised from the dead, then that consequence, death, continues to be a consequence. And his bodily resurrection means that he ascends into heaven, taking our humanity with him. And that means that as he intercedes for us, he knows what we're going through. And he understands our humanity and, and remains connected to our humanity. And it's the promise of his return. The bodily resurrection of Christ means that what Christ did on the cross was complete and accepted. His sacrifice was sufficient. And the resurrection means that the price has been paid and you and I can be saved. Resurrection is vitally important for the identity and work of Christ. Secondly, Resurrection is important for us as individuals. It gives you and me hope because it breaks the power of our frailty and puts the bullies of frailty and death in their place. One of the sayings that we have is that there are only two things in life that are certain, and that is death and taxes. Well, the resurrection makes death not so sure. Taxes, unfortunately, I can't do anything about. But death is something that Jesus defeated. Death is a defeated enemy. It's a temporary enemy. Frailty is, is dealt a, de a resurrection blow by Christ. Because as he is raised from the dead, you and I will be raised from the dead. Our bodies, once grown frail and weak, will be resurrected new and, and, and made wonderful by Christ. And, and the resurrection is our hope. It is our hope that goes beyond the grave. It's the hope that comforts us when our loved ones pass away. It's the strength that will sustain us when we face our own mortality. Because mortality is not an end, but a door. A door that we walk through into eternal life. And thirdly, resurrection is important for the church. Because it makes the communion of the saints that we talked about two weeks ago beautifully accessible to you and me. That we understand that we have the church militant, the church here on earth, and we have the church triumphant, those who have died and have been raised with Christ and are with them in his presence now, and who are the great cloud of witnesses who are part and parcel of the great story and the great victory of the gospel. This is our hope. And the church is not just the church that exists in this life and in this world, but exists in the world to come. The resurrection was the cornerstone of the early church. During the Reformation, the cross became the central theme of Christianity. But for the early church, resurrection was the central theme. Life beyond death. This was the hope of the early church, and it was what sustained the early church during the time of persecution and martyrdom. And, and this hope of resurrection fueled the church through its most difficult time. Finally, 
Resurrection is important for the church because this is the doctrine that in modern times is under the greatest attack. Now today, within and without the church, there is a massive attack on the reality of the resurrection. And there are many, even within the church, who would deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, opting instead for some sense of spiritual resurrection, leaving you and me with a vague hope that we might be some kind of ethereal spirit floating around in the ether someday when we die, when instead the bodily resurrection of Christ offers us solid and firm hope. And the questions that are raised around the resurrection of Christ have direct consequences to your hope and mine, to the identity of the church, and most significantly, the identity and victory of Christ. And so this doctrine, the doctrine of the resurrection of the body, starting with Christ, but including you and me, is of vital importance to the church. And so this morning, I want to reflect on two aspects of the resurrection. The first thing that I want to do is spend a bit of time making some observations in support of the resurrection. And these are just a few common sense thoughts that when people throw mud at the resurrection or throw doubt at the resurrection, if you were simply to would simply consider these four basic thoughts that I'm going to offer you, it becomes so obvious that the resurrection is a significant doctrine that cannot be swept under the carpet and, ca and should not be easily doubted, that there is easy and ample proof that the resurrection is a sure hope and, and should not be doubted as easily as some imply it should be. The second thing that we're going to do is take a closer look at our scripture passage and just draw out five beautiful insights from that passage. So let's jump in. Let's look at four simple foundations for the reality and the veracity of the resurrection. And the first of those is that when you read the early resurrection accounts, it's very significant that the first witnesses of the resurrection were women. And this is an exciting development because as we often know, but I don't always realize how significant it is, the New Testament period, the Greco-Roman period, as well as the Ju period of Juda Judaism before that, the period of the Old Testament, were dominated by cultures that were profoundly patriarchal. In other words, these were male-dominated societies. In these societies, women were not regarded highly. They weren't allowed to own property, conduct business, and their testimony was not trusted in the courts. Now, this is an unfortunate situation and one that we don't necessarily approve of, but this was the reality of those times. And so it would be crazy if the early church were fabricating a story about the resurrection. It would be self-defeating to put women as the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection, because this would be ridiculed and doubted by many who lived within that culture who simply did not take women seriously. If the church was going to make up a story, they would have had people of the caliber of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, a member of the ruling council. They would have been the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection. But instead, this story survives, even though the first eyewitnesses are people that society did not take seriously, but Jesus took very seriously. And the fact that women are the first eyewitnesses of the resurrection is a beautiful vindication of the worth and value of women. And this is something that the gospel does again and again and again, is to go against the culture of the day and lift women up as those who are faithful and reliable and trustworthy. And so the fact that the story of the resurrection survives indicates that it must be true. If the first eyewitnesses would have been witnesses that society would not have found credible, if this was a lie, it would quickly have been exposed. Instead, in spite of the so-called weakness of the first witnesses, this story endures 
and continues to be taken seriously. And this is the first proof of the resurrection. The second significant proof is uh, very similar to the first, and that is that if you look at the accounts of the crucifixion and, and, and the events all around the crucifixion, the disciples aren't portrayed in very well. They're portrayed as cowardly, they ran away, they weren't there at the cross. Peter denied Jesus, Judas betrayed Jesus, the rest of them ran away. It's not a flattering picture of the disciples. And once again, one would say, if this was something they made up, then surely the disciples would have airbrushed themselves a little bit. They would have embellished the story a little bit, made themselves look better. After all, they would become the leaders of the early church. But instead, the story is told as it is, footsteps as it were. And the lead characters in the story, other than Jesus, are very human, very frail, very fragile, very human. And yet, in spite of the, the humanness that is portrayed of the early church leaders, the early church survives. Why? Because the story of the resurrection was true. The third comment I want to make in this regard is that Greco-Roman culture was extremely skeptical of physical resurrection. All the philosophers and, and all the thinking of the day, the thinking about the afterlife, was that the afterlife was some sort of spiritual nirvana, that our bodies were cons and physicality were considered the enemies of the spiritual. If you read Aristotle and Plato, and all the Greek philosophers, then, then body is bad and spirit is good. And the ultimate was to transcend one's body and, and get away into the realm of the spirit. And so any idea of physical resurrection would have, in Greco-Roman culture, seemed a step backwards, a downgrade instead of an upgrade. And we see this so clearly when Paul finds himself in Greece, on, in Athens, on the Areopagus, which was the mountain where all the philosophers gathered and shared their new thoughts. And he comes to offer a new thought about the unknown God. And as he talks about the God that they don't know, he introduces them to Jesus. But when he talks about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, that's when his audience loses interest. Acts 17.32 says this, when they heard about the resurrection, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Now, while that might sound hopeful, most scholars agree that even the second group who said, we want to hear you again on the subject, were politely dismissing Paul. And there is no evidence whatsoever that Paul got a second chance on the Areopagus. They were simply blowing him off, dismissing him, just saying, Forget it, buddy. We're not interested. And so the fact that, that physical resurrection went was diametrically opposed to the philosophy of the day, the prevailing philosophy of the day, that the story of the resurrection survived the first century is miraculous indeed and could only have been true. The last point, and maybe the most significant of them all, is that if the resurrection was a lie. It was a lie that somehow managed to have massive and lasting consequences. Because the church moved the day of worship. Remember the church came out of Judaism. And one of the most strongly contested and preserved aspects of Judaism was the Sabbath. The fact that Christianity survived having moved from the Sabbath to the first day of the week doesn't make sense. It shouldn't have survived. Not against the power of, of the tradition of Judaism. And yet it survives. Why? Because the belief in the resurrection was found to be true. But the second consequence of the resurrection is even greater. And that is that hundreds upon thousands of, of Christians within the first century faithfully faced death in the Colosseums, being put in front of gladiators and lions, and set on fire in Caesar's garden, they went to their death 
joyfully, hopefully, and with faith and hope and confidence and trust in God. And if, if the resurrection was a lie, then these people have to have been the most deluded people on the face of the planet. But instead, what we see is the church growing, growing and growing and growing in spite of the violent persecution that it experienced and the violent opposition that it experienced. The church grew. Why? Because the resurrection is true. So now we need to have a look at the significance of our passage. And I want to make five quick but very significant points. The first is, as we read John's Gospel and John's account of the resurrection, we can't get away from the amazing transformation from fear to hope. One moment, the disciples are locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. The next moment, fear is gone and their hearts and souls are free again. And this is the power of the resurrection to turn fear into hope. You and I can be so paralyzed by the fear of death, the fear of frailty, the fear of the loss of our loved ones, but the resurrection brings us hope. Secondly, we see the significance of the resurrection body. As Jesus appears to his disciples, he invites them to touch him, to look at the wounds in his hands, the wounds on his side. That invitation is pointedly given to Thomas and the significance of the physical resurrection of Christ is so important here. And in Luke's gospel, when Jesus appears to the disciples, he even eats fish in their midst. And in John 21, he sits down on the beach and cooks fish, which he and, he and the disciples eat together. But there is a sense of the physicality of Jesus' resurrection. And this is really, really important for our understanding of the resurrection. The resurrection is the resurrection of the physical body. We don't become disembodied spirits floating around in the ether. There is a physicality to our resurrection. The third point is that Jesus' resurrection, bodily resurrection, opens the door for Jesus to breathe his spirit on his disciples. And it's almost as though through his death where you and I are cleansed and justified before God so that our legal status before God is that our sins have been washed away. And Jesus maintains his physical connection to humanity by being resurrected in a physical body. These two things seem to open the door for you and I to be indwelt once again by God's Spirit. It was a possibility that existed before Adam and Eve sinned. And now, once again, that possibility exists. For you and me. The fourth picture I want to leave with you is that the story of Thomas is a significant one. I've already said that I think Thomas is misrepresented. I don't think he's just a weak pessimistic skeptic. I think Thomas is a man who has been through great pain. My personal theory is that we keep on being told that Th Thomas Didymus, and Didymus is his other name or uh, and, and, the, and the word means twin. And I can't help but wonder if Thomas didn't lose a twin, a twin brother or a twin sister, and that that vexed him, that it grieved him, that he struggled with it. Or maybe he struggled with the fact that he promised to die with Jesus and then hadn't had the courage to do it. But Thomas is a man of deep principle, and his doubt is not petty or stubborn. His doubt is real and Jesus is so gentle with him. And Jesus offers him such tangible hope. Interestingly enough, the moment Thomas experiences the resurrected Christ, he doesn't need to touch. He doesn't need to feel. And instead, he gives us the New Testament's most powerful affirmation of faith. And he says, my Lord and my God. This is the most powerful declaration of faith that the New Testament contains. And this comes from Thomas. What a beautiful moment. And what compassion the resurrected Jesus shows to Thomas who struggles. And Jesus doesn't rebuke him. He welcomes him. 
the fifth and final point is the little footnote that John ends the story with. When he says, Jesus did many other things, many other miracles, many other incredible things that aren't even written in this book. And it just struck me. You know, people are so quick to doubt the resurrection. But if we throw away the resurrection, then we start a, a chain event, you know, a series of uh, chain reactions. Because if we lose the resurrection, then maybe we need to lose many other aspects of Jesus' life. Instead, John simply ends his book by saying, this resurrection, oh, it's just part of a much bigger story of all the miracles of Christ. The miracle that he came into our world. The miracle that he took on our humanity, came as a helpless baby, lived in our midst, that he turned water into wine, that he healed the sick, that he raised the dead. Why should we be surprised that he rises from the dead too? It seems almost nonsensical for me that scholars and theologians seem to insist that for some other reason we have to deny the resurrection. Surely, if we deny the resurrection, we need to begin to deny everything else too. And after all, if Jesus is able to be part of creation, then physical resurrection is just a small feat in comparison to all of creation. What he did on the cross is so significant that resurrection simply is a continuation of that. And John really puts it in perspective. This is just part of what Jesus does. It's all connected. It all belongs together. And it tells a great story of how you and I can be saved. Cut out the resurrection. And we start cutting out lots of other pieces too. And it simply doesn't make sense to do that. So let me conclude. If you wind your way through the book of Acts, what's significant about all the preaching that you find there is that their theme is the resurrected Christ. Christ is risen. The early church was built on that foundation. The creed emphasizes the resurrection. But although it points to the resurrection of Jesus, it has two more nuances. The first is bodily resurrection, and the second is your resurrection and mine. And when we say that we believe in the resurrection of the body, we're saying those three things. Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a bodily resurrection, and it will be your and my resurrection too. This is what the resurrection is all about. So let me list it one last time, maybe this time in reverse order of importance. The first thing about the resurrection is that our bodies matter, our physicality matters. Resurrection will be physical. We will eat, we will hug, we'll embrace, we'll touch. And so it's best that we learn good physical habits right now, because the rest of eternity, we won't just be ethereal spirits, we'll be resurrected bodies, but bodies like Jesus that can appear behind locked doors, not limited by space and time. Transformed bodies, glorified bodies, but bodies nevertheless. The second most important thing is that we don't have to be bullied by frailty or death. Because we too will be resurrected. Paul describes Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. You and I will follow in his footsteps. He has led the way for us. And that leads us to the first and most important aspect of resurrection. And that is that Jesus defeated death. Not just by moving to the spiritual realm or to another dimension. If he was not resurrected physically, and we say that he was resurrected in spirit or in our memories or in another dimension, we had missed the point entirely. The enemy that had to be defeated was physical death, because that was the consequence of our sin. If physical death is not defeated, then our sin is not defeated. Jesus' physical resurrection means that he is King and Lord of all. It means that he paid the price for our sins, that he maintains his connection to humanity, and he becomes our hope of eternal life. Amen. I have believed in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. While we can't take up a physical offering, we can still respond to God's word and goodness by offering ourselves. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us in so many ways. Yet through our thoughts and actions, we are so undeserving. Forgive us our weakness, O Lord. Father, it is with contrite hearts that we bring to you our time, treasure and talent, asking you to use them in your great plan for our broken world. Help us to see you at work in our world. Renew us and use us, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Father God, for the precious gift of life. Thank you for the beauty of spring and that we can see your hands in the changing of the seasons. Thank you for family and friends who share special moments and help us through tough times. In the week ahead, Lord, please bless our beautiful country. Fill our leaders with wisdom and guide them to lead in righteousness and love. Please be with our teachers, our coaches, and help them to form young minds to follow in your footsteps. Lord, be with the elderly and the sick. Bless the doctors and nurses who care for them. We pray for the ministry and that your word would reach all the corners of the earth. We pray for those who are involved in outreach and also for those in need. We pray that you will be the center of each family and that family members will be bound together by love. Lastly, Lord, we pray for ourselves. Please be with us in our tribulation and give us peace. Help us to take heart because you have overcome the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
It's been a great privilege to be with you this morning. And I do pray that this message of resurrection will have resonated in your soul. That you would be vibrating with the hope and the comfort and the joy of the reality of the resurrection. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the companionship and help of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. And here are the birthdays and anniversaries for Emmanuel and Grace. On Sunday the 17th, Leslie and Kevin. On Monday the 18th, Sharon and Grace, who turns 9. On Tuesday the 19th, Rachel. On Wednesday the 20th, Vernie. On Thursday the 21st, it's Peter's birthday. And on Friday, the 22nd, Denise. On Saturday, the 23rd, Matthew turns 15. And Tinsuala and Muriel also have birthdays. Muriel turns 15 too. Our anniversaries, Sunday, the 17th, is Chanel and Christopher. Monday, the 18th, Liesel and Johan. On Tuesday, the 19th, Lazan and Steric. On Saturday, the 23rd, Lonwabu and Sipa Mandla. Let's pray for these people. Father God, please bless each person on his or her birthday or anniversary. May they feel your presence and joy in the year ahead. Amen.